In chapter 16, we will cover the importance of designing an effective audit test to gather appropriate evidence. We will also discuss substantive analytical procedures and the test of details of balances for the sales and collection cycle, specifically the account receivable balance sheet account. At the end of the chapter, you should be able to do the following. You should be able to describe the methodology for designing tests of details of balances using the audit risk model. Design and perform substantive analytical procedures for accounts in the sales and collection cycle. Design and perform tests of details of balances for accounts receivable. Obtain and evaluate accounts receivable confirmations. And lastly, design audit procedures for the audit of accounts receivable using an evidence planning worksheet as a guide. We will begin the chapter discussion by describing the methodology for designing tests of details of balances using the audit risk model. In order to obtain appropriate evidence from tests of details of balances, the auditor must satisfy the eight balance-related objectives. These objectives are the detailed tie-in, existence, completeness, accuracy, classification, cutoff, realizable value, and the client's rights to accounts receivable. In here, we have a summary of the methodology for designing tests of details of balances for accounts receivable as it relates directly to the evidence planning worksheet discussed in Chapter 9. The worksheet was partially completed for Phase 1 and Phase 2 in Chapter 9 and Chapter 15. In this chapter, the worksheet will continue to be completed as we discuss Phase 3 of the methodology for designing tests of details of balances for accounts receivable. You can find figure 16-1 on page 525 of your textbook. The tests of accounts receivables are based on the auditor's risk assessment to identify significant risks and assess the risk of material misstatement. As part of the assessment of risk of material misstatement, the auditor determines whether any of the risks identified are a significant risk. For most audits, revenue recognition is considered a significant risk because auditing standards require the auditor to presume that revenue recognition is a specific fraud risk. To set the performance materiality for accounts receivable, the auditor makes a preliminary judgment about materiality for the entire financial statement and then allocates the amount to each significant balance sheet account. Accounts receivable is typically one of the most material accounts for companies that sell on credit. Even when the ending balance in accounts receivable is small, the transactions occurring throughout the year in the sales and collection cycle are almost certain to be highly significant. Internal controls over sales and cash receipts and related accounts receivable are reasonably effective for most companies because they want to maintain good relations with customers. Auditors are especially concerned with the three aspects of internal controls. These are controls that prevent or detect embezzlement, controls over cutoff, and controls related to the allowance for uncollectible accounts. Figure 16-2 shows 
the relationship for the two primary classes of transactions in the sales and collection cycle, which are the sales and cash receipts transactions. This figure illustrates the aspects of the relationship and the effect of the balance related objectives, such as the occurrence transaction related objective affecting the existence balance related objective for the sales transaction, but for the cash receipts transaction, the occurrence transaction related objective affects the completeness balance related objective. As can be seen in figure 16-2, realizable value, rights and presentation, and the disclosure accounts receivable balance related objective are not affected by assess control risk for the classes of transactions. You can find figure 16-2 on page 528 of your textbook. Chapters 14 and 15 cover designing audit procedures for the test of controls and substantive tests of transactions, including deciding sample size and evaluating its results. The auditors use the results from the substantive test of transactions to determine the extent to which plan detection risk is satisfied for each accounts receivable balance related audit objective. Figure 16-7 is an example of an evidence planning worksheet used to decide test of details of balances for our example company Hillsburg Hardware. Evidence planning worksheet provides an aid to the auditor in Deciding the extent of testing to perform for the audit. You can find figure 16-7 on page 544 of your textbook. On the next slide, we will discuss designing and performing substantive analytical procedures for accounts in the sales and collection cycle. Most substantive analytical procedures performed during the detailed testing phase are done after the balance sheet date, but before tests of details of balances. Auditors perform both planning and substantive analytical procedures for the entire sales and collection cycle, not just accounts receivable. This is necessary because of the close relationship between this income statement and balance sheet accounts. In here, we have examples of ratios and comparisons used in analytical procedures for the sales and collection cycle, as well as the possible misstatement that the analytical procedures may uncover. Possible misstatements as seen in Table 16-1 affects both balance sheet and income statement accounts of the cycle. You can find Table 16-1 on page 529 of your textbook. Table 16-2 provides an example of the comparative trial balance information for the sales and collection cycle of our example company, Hillsburg Hardware. The data from this comparative information will be used by the auditor in the performance of analytical procedures. You will observe this application on Table 16-3 on the next slide. You can find Table 16-2 on page 530 of your textbook. In here, we have several illustrations of the application of ratios and comparisons together with the test results of the analytical procedures used for our example company, Hillsburg Hardware. The ratios and comparisons were used to identify potential misstatements. You can find Table 16-3 on page 
530 of your textbook. The appropriate test of details of balances depend on the factors listed in the evidence planning worksheet as seen on figure 16-7 on page 544 of your textbook. The task of combining the factors that determine the plan detection risk is complex because the measurement for each factor is imprecise and the appropriate weight given to each factor is highly subjective. Looking at the bottom row of figure 16 7 on page 544 of your textbook, you will observe the plan audit evidence for tests of details of balances for accounts receivable by objective. Moving on, we will now cover the design and performance of tests of details of balances for accounts receivable. Most tests of accounts receivable and the allowance for uncollectible accounts are based on the agent trial balance. The agent trial balance lists the balances in the accounts receivable master file at the balance sheet date for each individual customer. The list categorizes the balances due based on the time passed between the sale and the balance sheet date. In here, we have an illustration of a typical agent trial balance using information from our example company, Hillsburg Hardware. As seen in this figure, the total on the agent trial balance is the same as the total for the accounts receivable on the general ledger in figure 6-5 on page 154 of your textbook. The auditors test the information on the agent trial balance for detailed tie-in to verify that the population to be tested agrees with the general ledger and the accounts receivable master file. You can find figure 16-3 on page 532 of your textbook. Confirmation of customers' balances is the most important test of details of balances for determining existence of recorded transactions in accounts receivable. It is difficult to test for account balances omitted from the agent trial balance except by relying on the self-balancing nature of the accounts receivable master file. To test for accounts receivable accuracy, confirmation is the most common test used by an auditor. Normally, classification of accounts receivable is relatively easy by reviewing the agent trial balance for material receivables from affiliates officers, directors, or other related parties. Auditors should also verify whether any of the accounts or notes receivable are non-current and should be classified as such. Cut-off misstatements exist when current period transactions are recorded in the subsequent period or vice versa. Cut-off misstatements can occur for sales, sales returns, and allowances and cash receipts. For each, auditors require a threefold approach to determine the reasonableness of cut-off. This threefold approach are to decide on the appropriate criteria for cut-off, to evaluate whether the client has established adequate procedures to ensure a reasonable cut-off, and lastly, to test whether the cutoff was correct. Accounting standards require that companies state accounts receivable at the amount that will 
ultimately be collected, which is the realizable value of accounts receivable. The realizable value is equal to the gross accounts receivable less the allowance for uncollectible accounts. The allowance for uncollectible accounts is an estimate made by the client and it is necessary for auditors to determine if the client's allowance is reasonable. In here, we have an example of the analysis of the allowance for uncollectible accounts using our example company, Hillsburg Hardware. An analysis for this example shows that the allowance for uncollectible accounts was understated. Uh, the auditor, however, also concluded that the amount of understatement is not considered material, but will still be included on the summary of possible misstatement schedule prepared by the auditor. You can find figure 16-4 on page 536 of your textbook. The client's rights to accounts receivable is normally not a problem. The auditor must determine if any of the receivables are pledged, assigned, factored, or sold by the client. Tests of the presentation and disclosure related audit objectives are generally done as part of the completion phase of the audit. Some tests may be done with the test of balance related audit objectives. For example, the auditor must evaluate whether the client has separated material amounts requiring a separate disclosure, such as in the case of a related party receivable. On the next slide, we will discuss obtaining and evaluating accounts receivable confirmations. Auditing standards require that auditors should use external confirmations for accounts receivable unless the overall accounts receivable balance is immaterial or the auditor considers confirmations ineffective evidence because response rates will likely be inadequate or unreliable or lastly, the auditor's assessed level of the risk of material misstatement related to the accounts receivable is low and other evidence can be accumulated to provide sufficient evidence. If the auditor decides not to confirm accounts receivable that are material to the audit, the standards require that the auditor must provide justification and must document this justification in the audit files. There are two types of accounts receivable confirmations. The first type is the passive confirmation. In passive confirmation, a communication is addressed to the debtor requesting the recipient to confirm directly whether the balance as stated is correct or incorrect. In contrast, the second type of confirmation, which is the negative confirmation, a communication is addressed to the debtor, but requests for a response only when the debtor disagrees with the stated amount. Figure 16-5 in here illustrates a passive confirmation used in accounts receivable in the audit for our example company, Hillsburg Hardware. You can find figure 16-5 on page 539 of your textbook. Figure 16-6 illustrates an example of a negative confirmation used in the audit for our example company, Hillsburg Hardware. Uh, you can find figure 16-6 on page 540 of your textbook. Positive confirmations are more reliable, but negative confirmations are less costly.
Negative confirmations are acceptable as the sole substantive audit procedure only when all of the following circumstances are present. The auditor has assessed the risk of material misstatement as low. The population of items is made up of a large number of small homogeneous account balances. The auditor expects a low exception rate. And lastly, the auditor reasonably believes that recipients of negative confirmation requests will give the request adequate consideration. The most reliable evidence from confirmations is obtained when they are sent as close to the balance sheet date as possible. To complete an audit in a timely manner, confirmation at an interim date is permissible if internal controls are adequate. If the auditor decides to confirm accounts receivable before year end, the auditor typically prepares a roll forward schedule to reconcile accounts receivable at the confirmation date to accounts receivable at the balance sheet date. Sampling for confirming accounts receivable is based on the following factors. Performance materiality, inherent risk, control risk, achieved detection risk from other substantive tests, and the type of confirmation to be used. In selecting items for testing, some type of stratification is desirable with most confirmations of accounts receivable. The auditor should perform procedures to verify the addresses or email addresses used for the confirmation of the accounts receivable. For confirmation sent by mail, the auditor must maintain control of the confirmations until they are returned from the customer. The client may assist in preparing the confirmations, but the auditor must be responsible for mailing the confirmations, and the return address should be made to the auditor's address to ensure that undeliverable confirmations are returned to the auditor and not the client. Non-responses to passive confirmations provide no audit evidence, though non-responses to negative confirmations provide some evidence of the existence assertion. When passive confirmations are used, the auditing standards require the auditor to perform follow-up procedures. The documents and procedures included are the evidence of the receipt of cash for payment subsequent to the confirmation, the auditor examining the duplicate sales invoices to verify the actual issuance of an invoice as well as verifying the invoice date, the examination of shipping documents to test cutoff and to determine that a shipment was made, and lastly, the performance of an examination by the auditor of correspondence with the client to discover any disputed balances. The most commonly reported types of differences in confirmations include when payment that has already been made by the customer prior to the confirmation date but the client has not recorded the customer's payment. This should be carefully investigated for cut-off misstatements, lapping, or theft of cash. Another difference is the confirmation of goods having not been received. This typically can result because the client records the sale on the ship date when the customer may not have received the goods yet. Another difference is that the goods have been returned by the customer. This may occur because the client may have failed to record a credit memo for a sales return. And lastly, the difference is when clerical errors and disputed amounts exist. Normally in these cases, the auditor will ask the client to reconcile the differences. When all differences have been resolved by the client, 
the auditor must reevaluate the client's internal control. The misstatements must be analyzed to determine whether it was consistent or inconsistent with the original assessed level of control risk. If a significant number of misstatements occurred that are inconsistent with the assessment of control risk, it is necessary for the auditor to revise the assessment and consider the effect of the revision on the audit. On the next slide, we will discuss designing audit procedures for the audit of accounts receivable by using an evidence planning worksheet as a guide. The evidence planning worksheet presented in Figure 16 7 on page 544 of your textbook, as previously mentioned, is an aid for the auditor to decide the extent of planned tests of details of balances. The test and procedures is based on the test of controls, substantive tests of transactions, and the use of analytical procedures. Balance related audit objective and the audit program using our example company Hillsburg Hardware is presented here in Table 16-4. It shows the audit program for accounts receivable by objective and for the allowance for uncollectible accounts. It will provide for the basis of the auditor's planned audit evidence. You can find Table 16-4 on page 546 of your textbook. Table 16-5 shows the audit program for the test of details of balances using our example company, Hillsburg Hardware. The audit program in this illustration is in a performance format. It is identical to the audit program in Table 16-4 in the previous slide, except for procedure number four. Uh, you can find Table 16-5 on page 546 of your textbook. We have reached the end of the discussions for Chapter 16. In this chapter, we cover the audit methodology used in testing accounts receivable, specifically substantive analytical procedures and the test of details of balances. Please complete the required evaluation method for Chapter 16 as it will be part of your final grade. Use Blackboard to complete the requirements. You have reached the end of the course presentation for Chapter 16.